Okay, are you really are you ready to start really start the conference? So we can um uh, this is the first like keynote session in this conference, so now we can we can get started. Um first of all, like thank you for coming to the conference and then this is the like just beginning of the conference, so now we are full of energies and then um, <laughs> um, so uh, for our like plan is uh, for this session is uh, like um, keynote speaker is going to talk like 30 or 35 minutes or like 40 minutes and after that we have like 10 minutes of Q&A session so if you have like any questions and comment please like um, uh, Keep it, keep them uh, during the uh, keynote speaking, and then after that, we have to share and then uh, uh, have a Q and A session. Is that okay. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to like first introduce our first uh, keynote speaker. Uh, his name is Mark Devney. Uh, Mark Devney is a professor of critical theory at the University of uh, Brighton, in UK. His last book toured on improper politics. We think the uh, politics of post Marxism through the lenses of property, decoloniality, and propriety. He is currently completing two manuscripts. The first, the first is Rethinking Democratic Theory from Black Lives Matter to climate, uh, climate Crisis engages with the politics of democratic equality below and above the state. The second one is democracy, populism, and climate change. Serializes democratic politics after the Anthropocene. And, uh, and uh, Anthropocene and against the right-wing uh, populism of today. Ma, uh, the professor Devney has previously uh, published about the politics of uh, critical theory, the decolonial novel, the global politics of populism, the war on terror and the politics of relationality. He direct, uh, he is now directing the Center for Applied Philosophy, Politics and Ethics at the University of Brighton. Uh, so now we can like have a big uh, hands to the Professor Mark Devine. Um, can you hear me at the back, or do I need the mic? Should I put the mic on? You can hear? Okay. I prefer not to hold the mic, but I'll hold the mic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll ignore that. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, limit my talk to 35 minutes, um, but I'm not very good at controlling signifiers. They tend to follow one another and get lost sometimes. Uh, but I will do my best. But I want to begin just by thanking um, Alex, the ICCTP, the organizers, um, who've put this conference together. Um, a number of people who are in the room, I first met in 2019 at the University of Brighton, where Zeynep and I, together with two colleagues who aren't here today, organized a conference titled Fascism, Populism, Democracy. Um, at the time, I was worried about using the word fascism. Um, we had a question mark at the end of this. Um, and a number of people funded by the ICCTP and by the University of Brighton came there. And then, of course, we went into the four years of COVID, three years of COVID, which is still kind of ongoing. So it's the first time I've seen a number of the friends that I met at that conference. And it's, it's really wonderful to be here again today and to see those people. And I'm also very much looking forward to learning and listening from all of you. Um, the, my experience of authoritarianism is partly personal. I spent uh, 18 years living in apartheid South Africa. Uh, but I've also more recently experienced what might be called neoliberal authoritarianism. Uh, a few weeks before I left the university uh, to come here, uh, the university announced that it was making 140 redundancies. The redundancies were across the whole university. And when we questioned it and asked why there'd be no consultation, no discussion, we were told that it was to do with 
finance, that the money didn't add up, that we could no longer afford to pay for the staff. So some people are deemed, to use the words of human resources, redundant. This neoliberal form of authoritarianism is very different to the authoritarianism that I experienced and fought against. There are no police on the streets. There's no obviously discriminatory laws. Equality is in fact invoked as central to the process of making people redundant. So there's all sorts of equality clauses that go into the process of making people redundant. A supposedly neutral calculus tells us that there is no alternative. Neoliberal authoritarianism rewrites the language of social justice, but it deforms that language. Equality becomes equivalence. Accountability becomes accounting. Freedom becomes the self-valorization of the academic subject who has to pay for himself or herself or their selves. Although not the focus of today's lecture, neoliberal authoritarianism that disfigures the borrowed clothing of emancipation is the specter that lends sustenance to the racist and sexist authoritarian sensibility of our time. And I'll come back to that uh, as we go on. However, my topic today is different. I want to ask a, what on the surface looks like a very simple question. Why is it that the new authoritarianisms or the neo-fascisms of the present day actively deny climate change? And not just actively deny, but in fact encourage, as Bolsonaro did, the burning of the rainforest, encourage the extension of farming, the extension of industry, the extension of oil, and oil rapacious use of the environment at a time when everybody knows that this is more or less madness. When Bolsonaro in Brazil encourages the burning of the rainforest, when he tacitly supports or explicitly supports the murder of indigenous activists, of quilombos, the ancestors of the slaves, and other forest peoples, we're reminded of Trump, of Duterte, of a number of other neo-fascists. However, in conceptual terms, the place of climate denialism on the one hand, or its alternative eco-fascism on the other, where climate is acknowledged, but what is called for is the closure of the nation state, the protection of the environment in the name of the national people, uh, more rare than the denial, um, is rarely thought. However, rather than start with authoritarianism, I'm going to do something slightly different. I want to think about democracy, because authoritarianism is normally contrasted with democracy. But in fact, I think the contrast begs the question of what actually we understand by democracy. Having done that, I will then turn to talk about authoritarianism and its relationship to questions of land, climate, environment, and indigenous politics. So let me turn first to democratic politics. When we think of authoritarianism or neo-fascism, um, I'm, I'm not committed to the politics of getting completely obsessed with the names we use. Uh, we know the practices we're describing. Um, I, I understand why some scholars so obsessively uh, try to finesse these words. Um, the contrast that is drawn is always with democracy. In a kind of melancholy tone, we talk as if democracy is something we've actually lived through. We sigh with relief when Lula or Biden are elected. A, a relief which is justifiable, of course. Yet the conception of democracy that we invoke tends to be the bare minimum. Elections, freedom of expression and movement, a free press. Not, of course, to be disparaged. But is this really democracy? The long history of critique of liberal democracy demonstrates, and we all know this, its racist, its propertized, and its gender normative dynamics. The nation state, in my view, is one way of enclosing democracy, but there are a range of other tacit walls that police democracy, echoing Jacques Rancière's work on, on, on the police, within and beyond nation states. The passing off of so-called economic questions from democratic deliberation, you know, the history of 
the left is a history of making Oikos central to polis. But those questions seem to be passed off now. The internationalization of property law, both its deepening and its widening, so it applies to everything, including information, genetic information, a range of other things. The trade agreements that underpin the outsourcing of labor and production beyond the sovereign. The financialization of every aspect of existence. As Wendy Brown has argued, neoliberal rationality throttles democracy, but it simultaneously dethrones politics if politics is conceived of as the will of a democratic sovereign people. There is, of course, another border that limits democracy. It's a border that many of us don't even think about because we've never really experienced democratic participation. But that border structures the metaphysical presuppositions that underlie our global society. The distinction between man and animal or man and nature. The very idea of humanity relies upon the drawing of an apparently strict boundary between the human and its animal others, between the human and nature. Democratic participation depends upon an ideal of reason and of agency attributed to humans, a supposedly universal humanism. Of course, this universal humanism disguises other forms of power. A universal humanism which is secured by withdrawing reason, language from most creatures. In my view, animality and nature are political technologies that distribute participation in the polity. And as Zakia Iman Jackson argues, racialized gender and sex are the essential horizons for the production of the category animal. The metaphysics of being that distributes the relations between nature, animals, humanity, originates, they argue, in racist and exclusionary practices. I'll return to these borders that limit what we, how we even begin to imagine the possibilities for democratic participation. But rather than try to perfect representative democracy, how many theorists have spent their lives, political theorists, working through the, the contradictions of liberal democracy, the question of borders, the question of who belongs, the, the origins of the state, whether the people can overrule themselves. In my view, these are just wasted questions and wasted academic energy. I would argue instead that we need to begin to rethink the demos and rethink democracy if it's going to be pertinent to the critique of authoritarianism today. In other words, to put this very simply, I don't think that the idea of the democratic nation state, which is in fact the place that harbors the authoritarian sensibility, is the form of democratic alternative that we should be talking about. And that then begs the question, how do we conceptualize democratic politics? Well, let's go back to democracy, to the word. And here I'm drawing on a range of scholarship. Judith Butler, who unfortunately can't be with us, Josiah Ober, um, Laurie's work, Jacques Rancière. But I'm going to make three essential points. First, the notion of the demos. Who is the demos? Now, in in classical political theory, the demos was always contrasted with aristocracy and monarchy. As Josiah Roba notes, monarchy always referred to the number one, and the aristocrats were the few. But the demos, strangely, has no number. It's the third of three terms, and yet the first two terms specify number. The demos never specifies number. The demos does not predetermine, the word demos doesn't predetermine how many or who should exercise power. The demos is not something given. The demos is something constructed subsequent to the idea of the democratic nation state. The demos does not in itself require exclusion. In fact, if anything, the demos admits of no number. And as Judith Butler recently suggests, when she, talk, she takes pandemic and talks about pandemos, if one thinks of a pandemos and the pandemic invoking a pandemos, we might argue that the nation state was never the encloser or the holder of democratic politics. So my first argument is that the demos is not something we can specify in advance. 
Who counts as the demos is not something we can specify in advance. My second argument, though, concerns the word kratos, or power. And again, Josiah Ober gets this right. Kratos is not the power of a regime, what is normally thought of as political power. Unlike archaea, archaea is a form of power for the ancient Greeks that always refers back to a regime. Kratos means something completely different. Kratos indicates the common ability of all recognized as part of the demos to act. On my view, if we take these two things, we first of all extend the range of objects of democratic power, because what power is depends upon a common ability to act. And secondly, we are forced to ask the question, on what grounds are some excluded from the demos? Why do some belong and others not? Why do we have border checks that exclude the immigrant? The nation state that makes an active decision about who counts as part of the demos immediately opens the borders to the authoritarian practices of today. Only ask the immigrant. The immigrant knows authoritarianism before those of us who occupy so-called liberal democratic states know authoritarianism. Democracy, in my view, then, has no appropriate subject, no appropriate form, and no appropriate place. On these terms, democracy is no longer a Greek word or a property of the West. Rather, democracy is inappropriately appropriated by practices of equality that sustain a nonviolent democratic politics of translation. But it has no proper place. I'll give a sense in a moment of what I mean for this, for beginning to think about the history of democracy. But it's not the history of regimes which is what political theory tends to do. Think of those year one political theory courses you did, where you learned about all of the different regimes, the five or six different forms which democracy takes. Um, democracy, in my view, is not a history of regimes. We need to tear up political theory and start again. I'll say why in a moment. But third, I argue that democracy, and here I'm going to be slightly technical, democracy or democratic acts establish what will always already have been the case. Democracy is something that takes place in a very strange tense. You might call it the future anterior. It's improper and it's untimely. What do I mean by what will always already have been the case? Well, think of, let's say, Britain in the 1960s, when if you were a gay man or a lesbian woman, you simply had no rights, you could be arrested. Many were. We now look back at that time, and we don't say they were right because in the 1960s the ethos was different. What we say is they were wrong. Okay? Democracy in the present remakes our understanding of the past. It remakes our understanding of the past acts, of past ways of acting. So democracy as an act is untimely. It disturbs the past, but it also disturbs the future. It asserts what will always already have been the case. And in saying what will always already have been the case, it leaves the space for forms of equality that upset the forms of equality that we today take for granted. So what, what I, with that third moment, I'm inflecting something that Derrida speaks about when he talks about democracy to come, democracy a venire. Uh, but I'm trying to insist at the same time that democracy is something we do now, here and now, but it affects the past, it affects the future. And it's not something that is necessarily owned by or protected by the state. Democracy then is not an adjective that qualifies a regime, nor is it a noun that names a regime. Rather than speak of democratic regimes, and thus play the ratings game so beloved of political theorists, there are a whole strand of political theorists that literally rate democracies using quantifiable statistics, um, so, which I still can't believe. We can identify practices, histories, lost moments when democratic equality was extended and enacted. The subjects of such democratic enactments are the movements, the practices, the organizations, sometimes the individuals who came to embody democracy. This links the levelers in the 17th century in England with Black Lives Matter and Neo-Ornomenos today. 
we might then inflect the history of democracy in a slightly more radical way with Walter Benjamin. Benjamin, you'll recall, pictures the angel of history thus. He says, the angel of history's face is turned towards the past. While we perceive a chain of events, the angel of history sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. The storm propels the angel into the future while the pile grows higher. This, Benjamin says, is the storm we call progress. Benjamin is right. We live in the afterlife of past and present catastrophe. But the angel looking back must also reconstruct another world, those moments of resistance against catastrophe. Those moments, rare though they sometimes are, when democratic equality was enacted, when the horror was paused, when singular acts intervened, when individuals, organizations, communities, and yes, even sometimes regimes, extended democratic equality. A history of democracy then is a history of the democratic acts that establish the possibility of thinking a demos that violates the borders that structure the authoritarian world in which we live today. Now, if you, I don't know if you agree with, with, with me, but if you do, then you'll perhaps already have a sense of how I understand contemporary authoritarianism. And it's not that new. I view authoritarianism as a set of practices that undermine democratic equality. I don't view authoritarianism, again, as a form of regime. I think all democratic, so-called democratic regimes enact authoritarian practices. What we get with, an author with, with current forms of authoritarianism is the deepening of those practices that are already prevalent. There isn't actually that much that is different other than the explicit racism, the explicit misogyny, and sometimes the explicit use of violence. The new authoritarianisms are not as new as some might suggest. Of course, many of the features common to authoritarianism practices are mediatized in ways Adorno, Arendt, or Lefort could not even have imagined. But the racism, the patriarchy, the propertized presumption, the gender oppression is the same. It's little different to what I experienced in apartheid South Africa. Trump could well have been the president of apartheid South Africa. Trump and his allies invoke an imagined national community in an attempt to, to assert their presumed rights of possession linked to proprietary rights that echo these longer histories of oppression. Yet, and here things are different, this takes place when the imagined community of the nation has been remade. It's been dissected, stitched together in a global fabric that we've not yet fully grasped. Nations no longer possess, nation states no longer possess the ability or even the legal right to assert the sovereignty of an imagined demos. That's in part what the authoritarianisms promise that the sovereign demos will be restored. But that sovereign demos doesn't exist. That possibility, if it ever was present, has been lost in the, in the agreements that I spoke about earlier on, in the relations that the, the nation state, in, in effect, inflects internally, international and global relations. As Eva von Riedeke has argued, the propertized oppression they defend takes place when the institutionalized anchors and dispositions towards appropriation have been set loose from their moorings in the nation state. The fantasy of full sovereignty returns as the racist, authoritarian, and gender oppressive, oppressive attempt to restore an illusory past. This people is configured through a range of enemies, and the enemies differ depending on the authoritarianism we're speaking about. Trans people, immigrants, 
an internal minority, woman, on the assumption that the national community will be restored once the enemy has been wiped out. Of course, like the fascism of the 1930s, and I won't speak too long about this because I'm already beyond the time that I thought I would take to speak. <laughs> but like the fascisms, fascisms of the 1930s, neo-authoritarianisms neo have another enemy, neoliberalism in the form of finance capital. And here I actually agree, disagree with some scholars who argue that neoliberalism and neo-authoritarianism are more or less the same. I think they can be articulated, but I don't think they are the same. Neoliberal reason rejects, at least formally, if not in practice, discrimination based upon the contingent properties ascribed to or claimed by individuals. It insists instead on the justice of market logics, which in themselves do not discriminate. Milton Friedman famously argued that capitalism punishes racism and sexism without the need for state intervention. I mean, it's of course an illusion. I mean, Milton Friedman, uh, uh, yeah, uh, what an idiot. But anyway, unlike, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say things like that giving a formal <laughs> lecture. Unlike classical liberals, neoliberals also recognize that markets are not natural. They harness the state to securitize markets, to protect property, to enforce global property law, and they extend market logics to every realm of the social. Think only of the outsourcing of the state. The so-called welfare state is now the outsourced state. What used to be welfare provision is now provided by global companies like Serco that, under, that underpin the, wel the welfare, so-called welfare democracies we live in. Right-wing authoritarians reject the extension of civil and political liberties to immigrants, to gay men and women, feminist activists, environmentalists, transgender people, in the name of normality, in the name of what's proper. But they also reject the extension of the market to every aspect of life, insisting that state should intervene for the national people, often explicitly defined in racist and sexist terms. This means welfare chauvinism, welfare only for the true Hungarians, or alternatively, the co-articulation between neoliberalism and the nation state through investment and market, poli and market policies on national terms. In both cases, however, a defense of what Derrida terms carno phalogocentrism underlies this politics. Um, I, I, this ter the reason I use the term is because it's such a nice summary of everything Derrida always fought against. Carno meat-eating, phallic, male, logo, reason. Carno phallogocentrism, I can't quite pronounce it. But it's a nice and easy summary of what it is right-wing authoritarians attack and defend at the same time. Yet, I haven't really got to the main topic of this lecture. And I haven't done so because I wanted to talk about democracy in order to think about authoritarianism, the authoritarian Anthropocene differently. So what is the relationship between what we call the Anthropocene, and please note, the term is contested. I dislike the term because it suggests that all humanity somehow is responsible for the world we now live in, whereas in fact it's probably 500 million people have put us in the position that we, that we now live in. A small proportion of what we term humanity is responsible for the climate emergency, but the new authoritarians deny both the history, the truth, and their complicity in that responsibility. The rejection of climate science suggested by the authoritarian right is often simply characterized by those on the left as stupid. And of course it is. Who can't help laugh at some of the things that Donald Trump says? Never mind when we can't laugh at the things that he does. But there is a more fundamental problem, I think. There is an implicit ontology that views humanity as distinct from the set of relations that make life on Earth possible. Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment 
is, I think, the critical theory text we should return to if we want to understand the present. Not Habermas on communication or Velmer on recognition. Um, I mean, among other things, it's, yeah, no, so I won't say any more um, about those texts, but, but that's not where critical theory should be lodged. Adorno and Horkheimer, in one of the drafts to the Dialectic of Enlightenment, write in a section called Man and Animal. And this is in 1944, in the kitchen with Greta taking notes and actually contributing, as, as Ava von Riedeke has noted, to the text. Reason, they write, mercilessly advancing, belongs only to man. The animal from which man draws his bloody conclusion knows only irrational terror. The want of reason for animals has no words. The whole earth, they argue, echoing some of their arguments earlier in the text, bears witness to the glory of man. Unreasoning creatures encounter this glory throughout the ages, in war, in peace, in the arena, and in the slaughterhouse. Human beings do injury to animals. Human beings alone in doing this injury function as mechanically and as blindly and as automatically as the twitching limbs of the victim. Now, what's extraordinary about this quote is that, and it, it's no critical theory scholar whom I know is, has written in, in detail about this quote, is the articulation, and later on they, they articulate this back with, with the politics of gender, but it's the articulation between the idea of man in a society in which second nature, in which the possibility of democratic participation is lost, the massification of the world in which we live, attached directly to the ways in which animals and nature are treated. Indeed, we could read this conclusion to the dialectic of enlightenment, this note, as in fact a statement on how we should understand the dialectic of enlightenment. Of course, we're not just talking about animals. The Anthropocene is about the domination of the earth and of the planet, about the reduction of everything, including human labor, human resources departments, as we now are familiar with, to the idea that human beings are mere resources that are potentially redundant. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, I have spoken for longer than I wanted, but I've got, I'll try in the next five minutes to summarize how this works in terms of the overall argument. I assume then that we can only understand the climate crisis and responsibility for its terms. Sorry I, sorry, I assume that if we don't think the Anthropocene, we will not understand authoritarianism. In other words, I think there is a direct relationship between the forms of authoritarianism of today and the climate crisis. And I think too that there is a direct relationship between the form that democracy has taken and the climate crisis. There are at least three key moments that one might argue at the origin of the Anthropocene. The earliest origins of the crisis lies in the colonization of, of the Americas in the 16th and 17th century. Genocides in the Americas, later in Africa and in Southeast Asia, underpins the privatization of land, its remaking as a commodity, the establishment of transnational forms of commodity production and trade, Note the slave routes that were established in this period are still the routes that are used for many of the goods that are transported around the world today, including the main ports in Europe that, um, that have adapted the ports that were established then. Uh, so established transnational forms of commodity production and of course the marking of certain bodies as commodities. Climate politics is coloniality in the extreme and the same imaginaries are invoked by Trump and by Bolsonaro today, both the colonial and the climate imaginaries. A second key moment in the emergence of the climate crisis, as all of us know, is the Industrial Revolution. This was both a revolution in productive techniques and in the use of energy. Coal, gas, oil, prospected across the globe, beginning with the 1859 discovery of oil in the US, now the world's largest producer of oil. The establishment of a range of European controlled petroleum companies, 
organizing the extraction of fossil fuels in the Middle East, and the emergence of the Soviet Union, and then Russia, as the third major oil producer. It was also this configuration of energy politics that, as Timothy Mitchell has argued in Carbon Democracy, was the condition for the remaking of democracy and the limiting of democracy in the second half of the 20th century. We are today at a critical moment in the transformation of our relationship to energy use, and right-wing authoritarianism is closely allied with fossil fuel capital in its, an attempt, in its attempt to defend this legacy. The third key moment is, of course, the economic boom of the post-Second World War period. This is the period that has seen the biggest rise in emissions. This growth in emissions has slowed down, but it hasn't reduced since 1971. The negative consequences of long-term change in the atmosphere caused drought, flooding, and again, as we know, in the tropical zones of the world where colonial dispossession had already engendered poverty. And in the West, it affects differentially the poorest communities. But right-wing authoritarian, authoritarians, again, reject both the science and the historical demands that arise from this, from this legacy. Neoliberalism and neo-authoritarianism -author may differ, but they share a commitment to the idea that what we term nature is merely an object for human intervention and exploitation. Whether we work with the critical theoretical distinction between instrumental and communicative reason, Marx's account of the proletariat as the subject object of history, or the various progressivist accounts of social change, politics always has as its proper subject a humanity that has been separated from the world of nature. And note, it's not separated from nature, it's in fact the constitution of the object we call nature in the process of separation. These moments are co-constitutive. Um, it's not that nature pre-exists pre the existence of humanity. For most on the left, though, the problem is not humanity. In my view, and I hope that's clear from what I've already said, the drawing of the distinction between the human and the animal, the human and nature, is a techne. It's a practice that secures what is proper to humanity. And as I noted above, it secures a range of distinctions within humanity. In The Beast and the Sovereign, Derrida notes, and it's one of my favorite quotes from any critical theorist, Derrida writes, it is paradoxically on the basis of a fault or failing in man that man is made the subject who is master of nature and of the animal. From within the pit of his lack, an imminent lack, a quite different lack to that experienced by the animal, man installs or claims in a single movement what is proper to him, his superiority over what is called animal life. This, he says, is the law of an imperturbable logic, both Promethean and Adamic, both Greek and Abrahamic. Its invariance has not stopped being verified all the way through our modernity. What's interesting about the quote, and the reason I use it, is that if you read the quote carefully, what Derrida is offering a critique of is the so-called post-structural turn. The idea of a lack in man, which supposedly was the critique of humanism offered by Althusser and the post-Althusserian scholars, that lack is in fact the reaffirmation of a metaphysics that is definitive of man, or in Heidegger's terms, man is the being that in its lack can confront its death, unlike other animals. Um, so for Derrida, and I'm reading Derrida here alongside um, a range of decolonial scholars, um, for Derrida, the very subject man is at the heart of the forms of authoritarian politics that we live through today. And I agree with him. I think that if we're going to address authoritarianism, we need to begin with our understanding of what this creature that we call the human, in fact, is. Let me try and summarize because I'm running out of time and I haven't said everything I wanted to say, but that's fairly typical. Political theory has always relied on a particular ontology of the human. If the metaphysics of being that are the implicit infrastructure of this account are thrown into question, what becomes of the de democratic ideal of equality? 
In my view, it no longer has proper limits. It extends, as some scholars have noted, beyond the human. It forces us to rethink the idea of reason and agency. But how is this equality enacted or recognized? Democratic equality on these terms surprises us. It upsets what we've taken for granted. It breaks the borders that divide the human from its others. The borders that split nations. The borders between the living and the dead. A critical theory of the future both rethinks, rethinks democratic equality in a manner that radically questions the bounds that make the human, while simultaneously building a more capacious account of democratic relationality. And when I'm thinking here of democratic relationality, I have an echo in my mind of Hannah Arendt, who at the beginning of the life of the mind speaks about relationality, but doesn't, and she's often read this way, People think that Arendt speaks about relationality only for humans, but she's very, very clear. Relationality, she says, concerns our relations to a range of other species, to a range of what we call objects, to a world in which human beings, in which human beings are complicit. In more programmatic terms, what would this entail? And I'll finish with these points. First of all, it means rejecting the notion of the individual human being or of humanity as being possessed of an essence that distinguishes humans from other beings. Here I agree with Eltus' theoretical anti-humanism. It means rethinking the qualities that delimit participation in the demos, but it also means rethinking what counts as the demos. It means thinking the human as dispersed and comprised already of a range of other life forms, dependent in other words as uh, critical animal scholars have noted, on broader ecosystems for its continued existence. You are the, the holder of a range of ecosystems that make your life possible, and in fact that make your agency possible. Um, if you have too close a look at your face, you'll be deeply, deeply disturbed. It means extending to other species the assumption, the assumption that their continuation as species has value that is, ne that is neither merely instrumental nor something solely for human beings. And we've already engaged in the extinction of tens of thousands of species over the past few decades. It means coming to terms with the genocide that humans have committed against other animals and finding ways of compensating for that horror and violence that is constitutive of the human. And it means understanding that the idea of the human, and thus of the Anthropocene, was always inflected by, infle by racism, by exclusion. And that in fact, that racism and exclusion itself is supported by the ways in which nature and animality are constructed in the present age. I'll stop there, um, and thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Professor Devney. Um, I think it's the best way to open our conference, uh, uh, you know, the theme and the topic. And um, I'm sorry to forgot, like, um, mentioning his title first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his top title uh, was, I was, nice, Bordering Democracy, the Climate for Anthropocentric Authoritarianism. Uh, and about one hour ago, I point out that Alexis is disorganized, but I, it turned out to be that I'm the one who is <laughs> disorganized. Anyway, uh, we have uh, uh, five or ten minutes to uh, discuss, so if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, maybe this might be a little reductive question, but I have a question about how you see the relationship between nation-state and democracy, uh, and maybe the role of nation-state on the face of the crisis of democracy and on the, you know, maybe face of uh, climate crisis. Because do you see the relationship between democracy and nation-state inherently antinomic? So, you know, nation-state should be. I don't know, it can never be 
become operator or oh. sometimes an operator product, it's always a blended democracy. Uh, and also, or maybe there is some role, maybe okay. reserved for the administrator with regard to the economy of prices. So, so the, uh, see a lot of uh, yeah. in the European thinkers. Uh, I thought that that this would be a question people would want to ask. Um, so, so, so let me be, I'll try and be as precise as I can. I think that what we call the state is in fact comprised of a range of practices. And those ra that, that range of practice, so we often talk about the state and we try and label the state with one word. But in fact, states are contradictory places. And they comprise a range of different practices, some of which are always authoritarian. The drawing of borders, for example, and the exclusions that constitute those borders. But some of which can extend and have in the past extended equality. And just one very, very simple example, which also shows the contradictions. In Britain in, 19, in, in the immediate period after the Second World War, the National Health Service was invented. Now, the National Health Service today has been outsourced to private contractors in effect. But the National Health Service began with a very simple assumption that every person who was a British citizen, so note the contradiction, but every British citizen was entitled to free health care at the point at which they went to the doctor, paying no fee, and that their lives were more important than the cost that was attached to that. Now, that's a, and many other nation states have enacted these types of principles, but the principles are always contradictory. So what I want to do is it, I want to get rid of the label that says the state is democratic. What I'm more interested in is the ways in which different practices within states either encourage or discourage the possibility of extending equality. So, it, so in my view, it's a mistake to say democratic Britain. But it's not a mistake to pinpoint the moments, the practices, when equality is enacted, and then to defend and deepen those. Okay, because we live within nation states. They're always going to be undemocratic. But that doesn't mean that they sometimes act in ways that, uh, that are democratic. One might think of another moment when, when Angela Merkel um, nearly lost her job uh, in opening borders to Syrian migrants. Uh, which was unbelievable in the, and, and violated European conventions. Okay? And so she, she took a massive political risk, a conservative politician. But that logic that the immigrant um, has a place uh, should be recognized as part of the irrelevant demos. It's very rare for nation states to acknowledge that. And so there are moments, yes. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Matt. <coughs> Okay, so you're focusing very much about the distinction, or rather uh, lack of it, of, uh, um, of a desired lack of distinction between human and uh, animals, human. In, in inverted commas. In, yeah. in nature. Um, but I think uh, this, this distinction <coughs> goes all the way back to, to ancient Greece and to yeah. the hierarchical you. you uh, rarely, if if at all, uh, use the word hierarchy, but I think it's it's very uh, basic, it's very essential here because this kind of you know distinction between the human and the animalistic, it's a tool, it's a device in order to create social hierarchy between humans that are like more superior humans or humans which are like have this, like animalistic, and it goes all the way back to Aristotle in yeah. before. Uh, with yeah, the, the, slaves, the first book of the politics sets the sounds. Yeah. Exactly, with the slaves <coughs> who are, uh, you know, walk, uh, walk hunched or uh, walk uh, straight up, and the, and, and the connection between this and their ability to understand a new language. Uh, and Seal makes uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, arguments. Uh, and so, I would think maybe I, I'm going to formulate a question here. I, I wonder whether the uh, direction to go about it is, uh, is correct, because I think that before <coughs> eliminating the distinction between the human and the animal, uh, one should probably strive 
for less hierarchy and more equality amongst humans. And I'm not sure that either, and, and whether you go about it the opposite direction and you say, no, you, yeah. I, I, so I, mis, I misunderstand it. Because I'm, I'm going back to Van Sia, of course, and, and his uh, and the equality of intelligences and yeah. uh, you know, trying to establish uh, a level of the growth of society. So, <clears throat> This is, I mean, it's a question I've, I've been asked before um, about this work, and I, I want to inflect the question slightly differently. So in my reading, the origins of the category animal participates in that moment at which these um, forms of discrimination, let's call them, are established. In other words, if we don't address the relations human beings have to the category we call animal, then we simultaneously don't address the possibility for the emergence of authoritarianism. Um, so yes, of course, the most, you know, the most important thing is that we, we don't have people being shot on the streets in America simply because of the color of their skin. The most important thing is that the forms of discrimination that, that we live with, that we see every day, are eliminated. But I want at the same time to note that it is often animality that is deployed as the technology to describe, to locate, and to discipline precisely those people. Whether it's the way Bolsonaro describes indigenous people or women, okay, or the way Trump speaks about women. Uh, the way Aristotle speaks about this in the first book of the politics sets the tone for the rest of political theory. Aristotle makes very, very clear that woman and slaves are closer to nature, closer to animals. He describes the slave as, the, as, as only better than the animal because the slave has the capability of understanding the command but not themselves deciding how to act, which makes them perfect as beasts of burden. So note what, what I'm trying to point out is the co-articulation of a set of relations between humans in our, and let's stick with Aristotle, slavery, woman, the realm of reproduction, the realm of nature, and animality. And of course, there's another distinction that Aristotle um, introduces. He says, those who do not agree to be part of the polis are themselves like wild animals who can be shot down, hunted down. He doesn't say shot because they didn't have guns at the time. Who can be hunted down um, and killed as they wish. So, so in my view, if, if we don't begin to address those broader questions around the Anthropocene, then we, don't, then we leave the space open for the continuation of those practices. Um, and it, it's, not, it's not simply my view. A number of contemporary um, black pessimist scholars have made, this, made very similar arguments, tracing the history of the ways in which these words are deployed as forms of discipline for those categories of people who are deemed not fully human. Um, so I, I hope that makes the argument clear. It's not a matter of prioritizing. It's a matter of looking at the co-articulation of what we might call an overdetermined totality in which the different elements of the totality have a direct relation to each other. Um, oh, we have one more question. Oh, just a quick question. So how would you respond to the notion of uh, environmental authoritarianism? This is a term used to yeah. describe well the climate mitigation policy of China decides because what they are authoritarian regimes where they need to promote this kind of uh, climate policy with with very in a yeah. very heavy hand manner. And by doing so they also try to tighten control over the civil society and get rid of many yeah. civil rights and all that for them. So I just wonder well how they are not necessarily in opposition of authoritarianism yeah. and climate change. Well, the authoritarian regime well, do not does not necessarily deny climate yeah. change. So how would you yeah. You're absolutely right, and there is also the um, what, what's called eco-fascism, which is not what China is doing. We might call it eco-authoritarianism, but eco-fascism makes very similar arguments um, that the only ways in which we can rescue the future is to get rid of some human beings. To ensure that reproduction no longer takes place, 
that we control population, that there's a control over birth, so a biopolitics of exclusion and of death, effectively, to rescue the future. Now, China's not engaged in that, and there are other authoritarian regimes. One of my PhD students has worked this through. There are a number of authoritarian regimes that take similar positions to this. Um, I, my own view is that in the longer term, addressing the climate crisis requires democratization. The two are co-implied. So the authoritarianism of the Chinese state, the authoritarian practices, the limitations on the possibility of democratic participation are at the same time, despite what China says, are at the same, at the same time are structured around a basic insistence that China can produce, that China can consume energy. I think it's now the biggest consumer of energy. In the, no, the US is followed by China or well, the US was, it may be that China now is the biggest consumer of energy. So on the one hand, we have climate authoritarianism. On the other hand, we have the, the, the continued development of precisely the industries that support the globalized world in which we live, that require the exploitation of the environment. And let me just put this in another way. And sorry, now I'm just gonna be technical. If one is to do an accounting for what nations do, we need to stop counting the emissions in the nation. We need to start counting the emissions that the nation is responsible for in other parts of the globe. Okay. And that would, I think, change the ways in which we understand what's happening in China or in America, because America is responsible for enormous amounts of emissions through outsourced factories. Likewise, China is responsible for development projects in Brazil, in the Amazon rainforest, where Chinese engineers have advised Bolsonaro and prior to that, the military regime for the building of dams, uh, or in Africa, or in other parts of the world. So I, I, I'm, in my view, authoritarianism is always going to be linked to, a project, to projects that require resource extraction and the development of resource extraction in ways that are negative. Um, so I, 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 I take the importance of the question, but I also want to look below what is said and see what actually takes place. Because in a global world, it's no longer trading in emissions between countries that are responsible for their emissions, because the emissions, in fact, take place across the globe. Um, and the US and China are responsible for emissions that go way beyond the borders of the nation states. Um, I'm not sure that fully answers the question, but yes. OK. Um, yeah. Running out of time. So, if you have any questions and comment after uh, finishing this, you can uh, uh, have a dialogue. <laughs> and um, so, thank you. Le yeah, let's give you another big hand to thank you. thank you so much for your thank you. wonderful uh, lecture. And now, in five minutes, maybe oh, we already passed the time, but like in three or four minutes.